light controlled liquid crystal complex adaptive materials. It's um, great to see all of you here in Boulder today. Today we have a pre-workshop program and right now we'll have the very first session of this uh, pre-workshop program. With that, I would like to introduce our um, first um, session chair, Yves Lanzac, and uh, he will introduce all the speakers. Welcome to Boulder. So, hi everybody, so this is the first session of this uh, material and photonic tutorials and so our first speaker is Mark Cicerone from the East and we will talk about this broadband cars, microscopy, and overview and applications. Great, thanks. Um, it's great to be here, I love to come out west, uh, living in Maryland, it's nice to see the mountains again. And, uh, uh, Appreciate the, uh, the invitation to come out and speak. So I will be um, telling you about broadband cars microscopy. The lecture is is mostly an overview and uh, some, some detail about what's happening in the field. I'm at NIST, uh, the National. Oh, I don't need to tell you the acronym is um, in in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Uh, there's another uh, branch here in Boulder, and um, I'm in the biomaterials group. I'm the biomaterials group leader. We uh, have a uh, uh, program of uh, method development largely for, for tissue engineering and for regenerative medicine. Uh, I guess I, at this point I should have a little advertisement about this. We have a, have a very nice postdoctoral program, both for U.S. citizens and for non-citizens. Uh, it's uh, administered through the National Research Council. So if any of you are grad students looking for good postdocs, uh, I'll be around this morning and uh, you know, please come by. So let me start with a uh, short history of cars microscopy. In uh, 1965, the first, uh, first cars paper was published. It was done by a pair of people, a pair of guys from uh, Ford Motor Company, and amazingly, they did not call cars. Um, uh, later, though, in 1974, it was, it was named cars. Um, cars is great for combustion, and of course, this is what the folks at Ford Motor Company were, were doing. Um, and then in 1982, there's the first demonstration of cars microscopy. Uh, this was done in a rather inconvenient geometry, and so there was really only that one paper in 1982, and, and not much follow-up. In 1999, uh, Sonny G, who was in at Northwest, uh, rather at, uh, at uh, uh, Mattel, uh, uh, was doing some experiments with a, a very powerful pulse laser that they had just built. And um, spent a lot of money on it. They want to get some data. They were trying to do some frequency generation with it, and so they focused the beam on a substrate and found signal in a weird place, and and discovered or realized that this was the, the kite three. This was cars that they were generating, and the signal was much bigger than the kite three signal that they had to get. And um, so that was the first then of the, the modern day cars microscopy in 1999. Um, since that time. Uh, there have been this, you know, significant increase in publications in cars microscopy, and a number of reasons for that. It's, it's actually a very convenient uh, technique um, for, for microscopy. You can, depending on how you do the experiment, uh, you you get uh, you can get very good uh, spatial resolution um, with your uh, with your. Signal, so you can do microscopy on, on things like cells. These are adipocytes. Uh, these are actually mosaic stem cells that are differentiating into adipocytes. You can see them starting out uh, here, and, and in 190 or so hours, you start seeing little fat particles growing in. And, and cars is great for narrowband cars, which is what this is done on. It's, it's uh, great uh, for this kind of these kinds of experiments. So let me start with some fundamental principles. Um, how cars works, and uh, I think the thing that I like least uh, to see in the talk is a lot of equations. But I'm going to do this anyway, just real quick, because we probably have some physicists in here, that, and, and I think it's instructive. So, cars uh, is generated through a third order uh, nonlinear uh, by generating a third order nonlinear polarization in your in your material. Uh, you get that essentially by mixing three beams of light. 
<laughs> you get that by mixing three beams of light, uh, a pump, a probe, and stokes light. These are the electric fields, and they have arbitrary polarization angles. Those are the indices J, K, and L. And the chi 3 is the uh, third order nonlinearity in the sample. Uh, it's sample specific, and it has the form, uh, it, it's got this form, uh, it's got components from the isotropic and the uh, symmetric anisotropic, uh, anisotropic being invariant, which are uh, from Raman, from spontaneous Raman scatter. Uh, as you, oh, here we are. There's this delta uh, in, the, uh, in the equation here, and delta is the difference between the frequency of a Raman resonant mode in the material and the, the different, okay, so how am I going to say this? Let me try this again. Omega P is the pump frequency, omega S is the stokes frequency. So these are two frequencies of the input light. And, and the difference between these two frequencies, when it matches the resonant frequency, the vibrational resonant frequency in the sample, delta R goes to zero, you get a maximum in, your, in the modulus of your response, and, you, and your real response uh, goes through the spaceship. Okay. Or the amplitude shift from a negative to a positive amplitude. So, so the chi three is a is a uh, complex value, which uh, the, 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 the magnitude of which increases as you get near a Raman resonance and decreases on the other side. Uh, and you also have another component of the real response, which goes through this this uh, negative to positive amplitude transition. The, the total R signal is the, uh, actually the square of this, is proportional to the square of this polarization. And so the, the amplitude or the intensity of the cars uh, is, uh, is uh, proportional to the non, the chi non resonant plus a square plus the modulus of the chi resonant square plus this cross term. And so the important part here is this, this non resonant component is often very big. Yeah. It's, it's frequency independent, uh, so it doesn't have the same form as the as the resonant component. This is chi resonant, uh, frequency independent, and so it acts as sort of a, a solid uh, baseline uh, on which the resonant and the mixing terms sit. Um, often, the non-resonant component is much much larger than the resonant component, and this is a this is a big problem because uh, you care about. Uh, your, your resonant part of the signal, that's where you need your chemical uh, information. Um, but the chi resonant squared is typically much, much smaller than this, so it kind of disappears, and this is the only thing you're left with. Uh, and sometimes the shot noise in the non resonant component can round out uh, the real component that you're interested in. Another way to look at this, um, and maybe a simpler way to look at it, is uh, in this energy level diagram. We have molecules in the vibrational ground state to start with. Uh, the first photon, a pump photon, comes in and, and it gets these guys vibrating in some wild, uh, non resonant way uh, to, uh, rather, uh, uh, and then, in, as you know, in spontaneous Raman, that first photon comes in and then you hope that your molecule then relaxes to a vibrational, vibrationally excited state and emits a source photon. That's a spontaneous moment. Um, this process from this virtual state to the vibrational excited state is, uh, is uh, very, very improbable. And only one in every 10 to the 12 or so photons that goes in results in a, in a Raman scatter photon, in a spontaneous Raman. In cars, though, rather than waiting for our molecules to relax to a vibrational excited state, after putting in the first photon of light, and, and pumping up to this virtual state, another photon of light immediately comes in of a shorter, or rather lower energy, longer wavelength to stimulate emission. You can think about it as stimulating emission then to a vibrationally excited state. So we, we actually put in a Stokes photon, uh, which, which uh, populates this vibrational state. This vibrational state is fairly long lived, it's on the order of a picosecond, and so the next photon of light. Uh, comes in and scatters off at this state, exciting my virtual or my uh, resonant uh, vibrational state now up into a, another higher virtual state, 
and that immediately relaxes that with ground state, and this gives us our anchor steps like this is this is where the signal comes from. Uh, we know the frequencies of the pump, the stokes, and the probe, and, and we can measure the frequency of the any stokes light, and its intensity tells us about the uh, susceptibility uh, for this vibrational state at this particular uh, uh, energy. Uh, and that's the thing that we care about. We're doing, we're trying to do chemical microscopy. We want to know about these vibrational states. Now, that's this is the diagram we like to see because that's the one we hope always happens. But of course, it doesn't. Um, there's only one way to combine these three photons of light uh, to get this any stokes light that involves this vibrational state. And there are about 50 other ways to combine those three photons. Uh, that don't have anything to do with vibration, with, with vibrational resonance in the sample. I've drawn two of them here, and these is this is these composes the non-resonant background. This is the resonant part. This is the non-resonant. Because there are so many other ways to, to generate that same light, most of our light comes out as non-resonant. Okay, so um, in during the first process, you start with molecule with vibration of ground state, and you end with molecule with vibration of ground state. So you've got to have uh, momentum conservation. And so that's expressed in, in a phase matching relationship where the, phase, where the momentum of the two pump photons uh, has got equal momentum of the anti-stokes and the stokes light. Now, uh, here's, the, here's the relationship for, for the wave vector and the momentum of the photon. And if the refractive index were the same for all these wavelengths, you just have two parallel lines coming up and then coming back. But in real media, they're dispersive. You have change of refractive index with wavelength, and so you can't put all the beams in collinearly. Uh, you've got to cross them in a particular way. Now, in gas phase cars, this is great because you know what wave vibration you're looking for. You want to measure the temperature of a, of a burning gas, so you put your tube, you pump, and your stokes light in a particular angle. You know which angle your any stokes light is going to come out, and so you can look at it through a pinhole and you get spatial filtering of your light, and you get really good signal. <coughs> Um, in microscopy, of course, we can't do that. Uh, we want to focus, we want to highly fo uh, focus for a high numerical objective. And um, the, actually, the, the, the thing that, that Sonny discovered in this, in this experiment that I described to you is that when you uh, uh, put your pump and your stokes light through a high numerical aperture objective, you satisfy all of the uh, wave, uh, all of the, uh, the uh, phase matching requirements for a very broad band of light. So you put your light in and you can you can satisfy all of these, these phase matching requirements and, and you can get uh, a very broad spectrum out of your sample uh, just because of the high numerical aperture focusing. Okay, so that's great. Um, we can use an objective to focus very tightly, get high intensities of, of uh, light as well as meet all these phase matching requirements. The problem is that in order to generate cars, all of the light has got to focus in the same place at the same time. Um, and for a, an ideal objective, that would be great. But we have real objectives, and there is chromatic aberration. Uh, actually, chromatic aberration is, a, is, a, is an issue, and particularly in broadband parts of microscopy. Um, uh, here, this is just an expression for the, the spatial uh, intensity uh, of, of the beams. Uh, cars, like, you know, the car signal is uh, relies on all of the three, all three beams being in the same place at the same time. And for a, a, mi a microscope objective with a particular uh, axiomatic aberration, you can get significant loss in signal. So here I've plotted the numerical aperture objective on this axis, and the delta z for the for the focusing of the, the axiomatic aberration on this object on this axis. And the intensity is here, or the signal intensity is here. And you can see for even a three micron shift in the focal, in the uh, achromatic aberration, for a 0.6 numerical aperture, you lose you know, 90% of your signal. Uh, this becomes a, a real problem high numerical aperture. You've got to have all of your light being focused within a few hundred nanometers. So, this is a, a big issue. If anybody is thinking about doing broadband cars, you need to think about this. Um, some microscope objective manufacturers will give you the chromatic or the axial chromatic aberration plots. Um, some some won't do that. Okay, so let me talk now a little bit about signal frequency in broadband cars, uh, compare and contrast them just briefly. 
in single frequency cars, uh, you you have narrow band light for your pump. Uh, typically, this is this is ten wave numbers or so, uh, uh, seven or eight picoseconds, and uh, both your pump and your stokes. And, and when you have this narrow band light, uh, picosecond light for both the pump and the stokes, you can very carefully select the vibrational state that you're interested in. Okay, so you can you can populate that and you can probe it if you're interested in light. This has uh, got some real advantages. Uh, with the narrow band light, you can get all of your energy focused into a particular vibrational frequency and vibrational band, and you can get you can get signal very very quickly. So Sunny G uh, and and his postdocs now that are out at Purdue and uh, different places are have, have demonstrated this very nicely. The uh, the a common system is to have a band aid laser. Uh, you have a band aid laser uh, These are intrinsically uh, temporally blocked, and so you just generate your your pump here and your stokes here. Uh, you recombine them, put them in a microscope, and you can scan very very quickly. You can get video rate acquisition. Um, let's see, single element detector. We use a photomultiplier to 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 detect, so it's very quick, very fast. High spatial resolution, high contrast. The problem is uh, chemical resolution here. Um, there are three manufacturers now that are making a narrow band cars microscope. Uh, Olympus, I think, uh, Leica, and, 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 uh, and uh, I think Zeiss is now one. Um, all of them, uh, I mean, it's, becoming, it's, it's widely recognized that, that the real issue here, I mean, you get great, very fast images. Uh, the real issue here is that you don't really know what you're looking at. It's probably a CH stretch, um, but you will, you'll get you'll get contrast anytime you get a change in the uh, in the, the chi three susceptibility at that particular at that particular wavelength, and it could be just a change in density of the medium. Okay, so so chemical contrast is an issue. Now that's a really big issue for us. Uh, as I mentioned, um, my group does uh, tissue engineering. And so we're interested in putting cells on materials and, and having the cells differentiate. So starting with a stem cell and having it differentiate down to a chondrocyte or an osteoblast or something like this. And we want to track that differentiation. Those, that, that differentiation uh, occurs by very subtle chemical changes. And so we can't just look at the morphology that you get in the narrow band light. Um, we can, though, use broadband um, Raman uh, signal. To, to see the difference between the various different kinds of uh, cells. So these, this is uh, out of research literature for spontaneous Raman. Um, these are Raman spectra for different epithelial cells. These are just skin cells. Okay. And skin cells from the finger, from the arm, from the finger, from the tongue. And those these, things, these spectra look pretty similar at first glance. There are actually, uh, the differences in them are statistically significant. So um, after you have done the, the background work, Training work on your on your Raman spectrum. Uh, you can take a laser and shine it. I guess you wouldn't want to do this, but but you could you could shine it into tissue and you could tell what kind of epithelial cell that was. Okay, um, just just by getting the, the Raman spectrum. So that's great for us because we're looking for very much bigger changes than just these subtle differentiation changes. So so it's recognized then that to get good chemical contrast, you need broader than just the single frequency cars. So with a single frequency price, you can just pick up you know, one of these vibrations and you can get the whole band. So a number of people have been working on this. Multiplex cars, sort of a thousand wave numbers, uh, sort of maybe a region this size. Um, there have been other people, a number of people have done that. Uh, we have been focusing on broadband cars, which is a, a full 3,000 wave number bandwidth. Um, and we do this, the, the trick here is to uh, we use narrow band pump, but the trick is to use a broadband stokes light, and we generate that. Uh, there, you can do this in, in any of a, a small number of ways, but we generate it with a photonic crystal fiber. So, single laser, we split part of the, the, uh, the laser off and put it into a photonic crystal fiber, generate this very broad continuum. Uh, the other part, we uh, narrow, spectrally narrow, we have a pump, we recombine those in our sample, and we inspect that, and we inspect it. So, um, setup is, is, is fairly simple in principle. You just need a laser and a photonic crystal fiber, and then some timing and, and spectrofiltering, and a, and a spectrograph, and a microscope. 
Um, so uh, what we get then is, is we get these full spectra in single shot and um, sort of 17 millisecond acquisition. This is a tertiary blend of uh, polyethylene terephthalate, Peter Main polystyrene, and we can very easily tell the difference between the different different phases. And so we can generate this phase map very quickly, just in a couple of minutes. Um, now, so let's make a comment here. Uh, the car signal is proportional to the square of the concentration of your oscillator, of your uh, of your you know, of your oscillator, and so. In materials, it's great because there's all sorts of vibrational oscillators in there. They're all packed together. Um, when you go to cells, it's a different story. Um, in the cells, most everything is water. Okay, proteins are in the cells at about 10 mg per mil, 10, 15 mg per mil. Uh, in the membrane, of course, you've got a lot of fat, and so you've got a lot of speed stretch. And, and that's what you're seeing here. Um, these are adipocytes, and these, little, these fat globules that you see in the adipocytes, you can see parts of the membrane. Uh, what we wanted to see was a fingerprint region in these cells, and so this is a, this is a symmetric C H two symmetric stretch from from fat. We see it also here in the membrane. Uh, here in the cytosol inside the cell, we wanted to see something. We hoped to see something uh, that told us about the protein content of the cell. It's just in there. I mean, it's just buried in noise. Um, so this image we got about four years ago, and, and it was clear there was a lot of work to be done. This is. Uh, this is really the issue with broadband cars. Um, you're spreading out your signal over broad uh, bandwidth, and uh, so while you started out uh, in sort of behind the eight ball with the non-resident background being so large, now it's really become a much much bigger problem. And so we get this situation where we really weren't able to see initially any any uh, other fingerprint region. So we took sort of a two prong approach at trying to remedy this issue. Um, we'd like, of course, just to crank up the, the power and try to and try to bring up our signal. You can't do that with live cells because you, you, you kill them. Um, in fact, in a two-foot convolution, this is pretty well developed, uh, it's pretty well established that um, there's a, a, a limit to the amount of light that you can put on the cells before you start, before they start behaving abnormally. What happens is you get DNA damage. And uh, actually, this is a I think it's this paper where they talk about, uh, where Conan talks about um, turning up the power up to about uh, 10 milliwatts. And at this point, uh, he started seeing little flashes of light in the cells. Okay. That's usually a bad thing. Uh, so so you can't just turn the power up um, uh, uh, In fact, right around 2 milliwatts is where, is where they started seeing damage for, for 730, 760 damage. And this is about where we were in this image that I showed you previously. So we can't put more light on it, at least not at this wavelength. Um, so we, we see, we look for a way to use the light more efficiently. efficiently. Uh, and the other thing is that um, we can, in fact, go to longer wavelengths because this this photo damage that we're seeing evidence of here uh, is likely uh, a. It's, it's pretty well established that, that an important component of that is a three photon absorption in, in the protein backbone and to the DNA backbone. And that's in fact where those flashes of light were coming from. Um, so we have been using a Thai Sapphire system around 800 nanometers with, you know, with our stove slider at 1050. Um, you can see that around 800 is about the peak in the uh, three photon absorption for protein. So we were, we were hitting it just exactly the wrong place. So what we want to do, or what we have done, is gone out now to use a, a, a turbine fiber laser at, 30, at uh, 10, 1040 roughly. Uh, we can generate a pump light at around 950 from that. And so we're now using this window. Uh, this is a water window for, for uh, red enough so that we don't get much through photon absorption from into the protein. And we're blue enough that we're not off into the, into the water uh, absorption region. Uh, just a comment here. We can we expect to be able to go at least a factor of ten in light intensity uh, more than what we could at eight hundred. And so this is a chi three process, so that's a thousand fold more signal. Okay, so that's that's moving in the right direction. Um, the other thing that we'd like to be able to do, and I, I mentioned using the light more efficiently, uh, in all of the cores like our energy diagrams that I've shown you, we rely on two photons from the pump, right? 
to, to create the initial non-resident uh, non uh, virtual state and then to pump the vibrational the vibrational coherence up into another state. So we're we're quadratic in the pump intensity. Now the pump is off to the blue, and we'd much rather be quadratic if we could in the Stokes intensity, in the broadband intensity, uh, because we can we can stand and put more red light on the sample than we can blue. Um, okay, so I just taught you through this this slide before I got to it. Um, uh, this is the uh, our broadband. When we use one photon of the broadband and two photons of the narrowband, we get the car signal out here, which is just a, a symmetric uh, around the around the, the, the pump. So energy-wise, it's symmetric around the pump. And this is the this is the kind of uh, uh, coherence generation that we're talking about: the narrowband, the broadband, the steps, and the narrowband pump, of course. And that's what this looks like. There's another way actually to get signal, and that is uh, using a three-color arrangement. Where if we can use two photons from the broadband, one uh, on the blue side of the broadband uh, envelope to generate for our pump, uh, another one on the red side of the envelope to generate the Stokes light, and then from the narrow band in our probe, this one's got to be narrow because the well, the, the bandwidth of this particular pulse determines the spectral resolution that we get in our in our signal. Um, now, doing this, we get a, a car signal that looks like this. It starts right at the, uh, at the, at the probe uh, wavelength. It's got the next one there, and it drops off this way. Um, and it uses, of course, two photons from, from this broadband, red shifted pulse, and then only one from this one. Uh, we were able to generate this um, from this photonic crystal fiber. Now, I don't know if how much well, so photonic crystal fibers are really nice in that you can generate broadband light from them but the temporal uh, characteristics of this light are not great um, the, the light comes out in solitons it comes out with big, big chirps sometimes you can't compensate the chirp because it's just so so pathological um, this is uh, tell you what this this is a uh, a car spectrum time resolved car spectrum that we get by delaying the pump, uh, uh, rather the probe pulse. Let me, let me back up on it. I'll try to explain this better. Um, in this experiment, we use the broadband, or we, we use the broadband light uh, to pump and, and to probe, and then we uh, delay the, the narrowband. Uh, we, we, can, we can put that on the delay stage, and we can move change the arrival of this narrowband probe and, um, and so what we can do is determine when the light comes out of the fiber uh, because when we delay our probe pulse to be coincident with the with the arrival of the light from the continuum light coming out of the fiber we get our first generation. Alright so so what this tells you with this uh, slanted uh, uh, signal tells you is that our red light is arriving, our red light is arriving, arriving first, and the blue light light is arriving later in our in our continuum. This is essentially a time signature of the light coming out of the fiber, continuing fiber. Now we get this other component here, which seems to be uh, well. This is actually our three color signal. This is the two color signal. This is the three color signal. We can tell because when we take when we put a uh, filter on the continuum light and filter out the light that would have generated uh, uh, the antistokes light at this wavelength, we still get the antistokes light. And what that tells us is that um, the, the coherence we're generating here is just generated by interaction of these two solid objects that just happen to come out of the fiber at the same time. Um, so we can show that uh, not only in this way by putting this filter in and still getting the signal here, but also by changing the amplitude and the intensity of our, our pump light, the narrow band pump. And you can see this region uh, shows up as quadratic in dependence of uh, pump power, and this region is just linear in dependence of pump power. So, so we have in fact down what we think we've done. This is what we really want. We want to rely on this, this uh, uh, broadband pulse. We can, uh, we can compress it in time, we can get very high intensities. Uh, with reduced photodiversity. Um, but 
we really can't use this pulse. I mean, we really, this, this has got exolotons in it. There's no way to compress this properly. Uh, so what we, and, and, and uh, chirp is actually very important. I'm going to skip this slide. Just chirp is important if you're trying to do this uh, 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 coherence generation this way. If you're, if you're, uh, I guess I'll just do it. If you're, uh, if you're, the red and blue components in your broadband, um, uh, broadband pulse are coming out at different times. Obviously, they can't interact with one another, and you don't get your coherence. Okay, so uh, we've been looking for a replacement of these photonic crystal fibers. Uh, there's a germanium oxide doped fiber, which which was very promising to us. We did simulations on this, and uh, it looked like we were going to be able to get very nice uh, continuum that was very compressible that had no solitons in it. And we did a lot of work. We published a couple of papers. Uh, it was great. And we were very optimistic. This was the, uh, there was some experimental work here as well. Um, this is what, this is the chirp profile we're able to get just with linear compensation. So with the spatial optimus there, for example, we should be able to flatten that right out and get very good, very good uh, uh, compression. Well, um, we finally got the thing set up on our car system, and some days we get these wonderful pulses. This is linear compression, and you know all we need to do now is put this through a spatial light modulator, and we can compress that very easily into a into a transform movement pulse, and we get great signal. Um, but this is what it looks like some days, and this is what it looks like some days, and we can't figure out uh, why. Um, we've spent a fair amount of time on this. There's you know a number of things we look at, and what we think now is going on is that this is a fiber laser we're using, and we think that there are some phase drifts in the in the output pulse of the laser. And so now we have gone to actively controlling the phase, uh, the output phase of our laser, and we're and that, that's something we're working on right now. So I don't have uh, I don't have the, the happy ending to this particular story, um, although I'm confident that we'll see it. The other thing we're doing with this. Um, is uh, we have started experimenting now with these uh, double, double uh, zero dispersion fibers. Uh, if any of you follow this, this literature, these are very nice. Um, uh, these are these are photonic crystal fibers, which give uh, uh, much more stable continuum. So uh, the so at this point, I just want to make a comment that this is sort of where the broadband of cars field is right now. Uh, there's a recognition that yeah, there's Great potential here. We can get we can get uh, chemical resolution, you know, broadband chemical uh, uh, resolution Im uh, imaging. Um, but there are issues with uh, stable signal and with this non resonant background. Okay. Uh, I'm very optimistic. I think we're moving in the right direction, and I'm uh, confident. Um, in fact, you'll see that we've already been able to do some very nice things just with the with the in the art and the state that it's in. And I hope to get to that you know, in a few minutes. Um, let's see, I think I've got 10 more minutes, so I'm going to go through, what's that? Okay, okay. so I'm going to uh, try to hit on some, some other topics now that are, that are related, uh, actually closely related to broadband cars. Um, I've mentioned a couple of times that non-resident background is, uh, is really a uh, bad thing uh, for us. It's kind of like a gator in the back door. Uh, you just really wish it could go away. Um, and so we spend a lot of time. In fact, since you know, since uh, cars uh, microscopy was starting to be practiced, this has been a big issue. People have spent a long time working on, and, and we're working on uh, previous to the microscopy that's becoming uh, increasingly important now. So there are a number of ways that people have, uh, a number of approaches people have taken to to try to avoid this non resonant background problem. Um, one is inhibit detection. So. Here's a setup that, that Sonny and his uh, co-workers uh, put together. Uh, you've got your pump and stokes light coming in through an objective, creates your signal, and this is a forward car, so this is classically the way you detect cars, is in a forward geometry. Uh, and, and the reason for that is that in, in your focal point here, what you have essentially generated is uh, a phased array of coherent, uh, coherent oscillation. So our signal, our, our vibrating molecules are right here, and they're all vibrating in phase. The phase um, uh, progresses in, 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 in space, 
so that if, you, if this was a Hertzian oscillator, it, you, it's an antenna which just uh, projects in that direction. And so you get all of your signal going in one direction, that's your any steps light. Uh, classically, that's what happens in cars uh, when, you have a, when you've got a fat, you know, a thick sample. Uh, on the other hand, and, and so you get your flow rate signal. Now, your, your non resonant background goes this way, and your resonant component from your thick signal goes the same way. Not much comes back because of this destructive coherence for light trying to travel that way. When you've got a very thin sample, on the other hand, it's, it's a single dipole and it, it, it radiates everywhere. So, so with uh, heavy detected cars, you get, um, you get signal coming back as well as going forward. Uh, naturally, the, the only time you get really good contrast here is if you've got very thin features, a cell membrane, uh, mitochondrium, something like that. And so those are just a couple of examples. Uh, kind of hard to appreciate, maybe, but the background here is much darker than the background there. And you, you see different features here that you see now. So that's one approach. This works great for, for thin features. Uh, if you've got thick features that you want to see, then, then this is not going to do you much good. Um, the next approach uh, that we'll talk briefly about is, is polarized cars. So, um, I think it was Shen that first uh, came up with this uh, some time ago, uh, found that, that you could um, more, uh, manipulate the polarization of the light coming into your sample, uh, both your, your stokes and your pump light, and your non-resident background comes out at a particular angle, and your resident component, in, in, in general, comes out at a different angle. Okay. It's not much different. Um, in fact, it's, it's very not much different. Uh, you, you by, by, if your sample is isotropic and there's no, um, and there's no bar fringes, you can get like a 601 uh, rejection ratio of your non-resident background, but your resident component also drops off by you know, almost two orders of magnitude, two orders of magnitude. So, so there's a little bit of an increase in signal to noise, but at a big cost to the to, to, to overall signal level. Um, and again, this is no good for prior printed samples. I suspect most of you work with prior printed samples. Um, the next approach is um, time delay detection. I've, I've sort of touched on this already. The, you can generate, if you, have, if you have control of temporal control of your pump, your stokes, and your probe light independently, you can generate coherence by pumping and then, and then getting, uh, generating, uh, or by having you pump your stokes like at the same time, and then time delay your probe. If you do that, uh, you can detect the car signal, you know, comes up uh, as you back the probe from negative time. Now the probe is coincident with pump the stokes, so you can imagine the signal as, as you march the probe arrival time on, you start to get this oscillatory signal, which tells you about the uh, vibration, the coherence, and depopulation of this of this coherent vibration that you can. Uh, so this is this is a, a nice general way to do uh, to uh, discriminate against a non-resonant background. You can see this big peak that comes up and dies. That's sort of, that's that is where all of the non-resonant peak is contained. So if you can park your timing off right around right here, you can in principle get your vibrational spectrum. Uh, without an the background. And that's what we've been able to do uh, with the broadband light. And this is the uh, spectrum of polysiron uh, uh, and conuene. And, and this is with the, with the continuum light and the narrow band, so uh, uh, coincident in time. And we get all of this non the background, of course, out here uh, in the 3000 wave number in the C stretch, we get lots of signal. Not much in the fingerprint, and nothing you can really recognize. When you now let the continuum come in first, generate the coherence, and then you wait for about one and a half peaks, one point two picoseconds for your narrow band light, all of this non resonant component completely disappears. You're left with this beautiful fingerprint spectrum, and, um, and that's what we're looking for. So, uh, this works great for this set, uh, signal or this sample because um, the this particular vibration, uh, this phenomenal vibration, uh, is very long lived. It's got a long uh, vibrational defacing time. And so we can march that, uh, this coherence lasts a long time, and so we can march our pump, uh, our, our probe will stop for a long time when all of the non and stuff is okay, and we get good signal. In general, um, you can't always do that. So here's just a, a, mic a microscope uh, uh, 
uh, image uh, at the time zero. You can't see any contrast between the dull UV and the polystar green. And at uh, 3.6 picoseconds, you get this great contrast. And so this just demonstrates that you can use this, this difference in your phasing contrast or this contrast. Um, so as I mentioned, this worked in this case. Uh, Particularly in the fingerprint region of biological samples, it's not going to be a good approach because those vibrations have very fast phasing times. And so um, the sort of extension of this kind of approach is to not just park at one place, uh, time delay for your probe, but in fact march your probe down many, many time delays. Uh, and this is, this is like an interferometric uh, detection, cross detection. Um, it takes a long time. Uh, you know, you've got to get thousands of data points, and you've got to, uh, actually the data point acquisition is going to take a long time, but you can, in fact, do a very nice job uh, getting rid of your non resident background. Uh, we took an approach that was sort of a hybrid of this and a spectroscopic approach, and that was to generate a very broad band local oscillator to do our inter 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 interferometry with. And we generated that low velocity. This does not show up at all, I'm sorry. Uh, we have stokes light in one direction and in orthogonal to one another. We have a broadband pump and a narrowband pump. Okay. And the ideal was with the broadband pump, interaction between the broadband pump and the stokes, we generate this low velocity. Uh, it's mostly flat phase. Uh, there's, no, there's no resonant, I mean, any resonant components in it are, are spread out over, over broad frequency. And so it looks a little bit like a little and we're getting a very nice flat phase, which is quite a trick, um, uh, but we were able to do it. Then we wanted to interfere that with the, the car signal that comes out that's a product of the narrowband uh, pump and the soaps. And that works, but we don't just get those two signals. We actually get the mixing terms of those signals as well, which made this uh, Kind of tricky and mathematically unwieldy, and uh, we were able to do it. You know, we had to we had to modulate the phase, and we had to take ten or twelve phase points. Is all uh, I said. We did more than that. I think a hundred phase points, but that's you know better than several thousand um, with the narrow band approach, and uh, we got it. Um, but it was lots of work, and the game was meager. The tech we didn't have the technology to to, to do the very fast phase modulation that we would have had to do to get the signal to noise uh, increased. Um, what we really would like to have done here, uh, which we couldn't do because of all the mixing between the, the narrow band and the broad band pulse, is to just park our phase in one place uh, where the non resonant background disappears and get our, our signal. Uh, so we have now used the, uh, the uh, three color bars that, that I mentioned uh, that we're trying to push towards this three color bars uh, signal generation. We can use that. Uh, and in the way we use three color bars, there's no mixing between a narrow band and a broad band uh, pulse. The, 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 the car signals don't, don't mix with each other as they did when you were doing two color bars. And so now we can use a femtosecond and a picosecond pulse, and uh, we can eliminate the numbers of background completely when this, when these criteria are met, the, the phase difference between these two pulses is equal to pi, and their aggregate intensity, their greater intensity. Um, and so I'm just going to show you the pictures. Uh, we start with this uh, signal uh, with lots of non-resident garbage here, and uh, when we when we meet the the, the criteria, uh, we're left. This is not perfect, uh, but we're left with peaks that, that uh, we can sort of identify here, and our signal noise is a little bit better here. Uh, not. Well, this is, these are not beautiful images, okay? There's not beautiful spectrum, but, but it, it's, a, it's a proof of principle that we can do this. Uh, we do the same thing now. Uh, another flavor of this is just having two pro pulses um, side by side, and we get the same thing. When we, when we match the phase, when we have the phase uh, by a part, when we match the intensity, we can take all this non resonant background, bring it down, and then we can recover all of the peaks of the spectrum that we expect to see. Okay, so um, I'm going to tell you just two very quick stories about digital signal extraction because um, this is another important uh, current in this field right now. Um, 
I mentioned that in the, in the spontaneous realm, um, literature, uh, multivariate analysis is often used to, to map, to do to get spatial realm maps. Uh, and I won't explain how this is done, but uh, you can look that up if you're interested. This is a, an image from Max Diem at Northeastern University. There's a HeLa cell uh, with mitotrack green here. So this is mitochondria where the green shows up. This is a ROM map uh, without any, without any uh, stain. And you can see also that they can find mitochondria with this, with this multivariate analysis approach. So that essentially they can pick out what the mitochondrial spectrum looks like and they can locate that. So this image takes on the order of an hour and a half, and, and you, you can sort of do it with a live cell once, uh, but you can kind of kill it after a couple, a couple times. Uh, we're doing the same thing with cars now. Uh, these are, these are uh, uh, tissues uh, from thyroid cancer. Uh, this is a normal tissue region and a cancerous tissue region. Uh, we image this in about a minute, and this, of course, this is a tissue section, so we don't care too much about killing it, but, uh, but we can issue it, we can image it very quickly, and we can get Raman signatures of the healthy versus the uh, versus the disease tissue. And this is work in progress, um, but, uh, but we're very encouraged. And this is without any of the numbers in background uh, uh, suppression. We can do this just with the signal we get uh, straight out of the out of the car signal. Um, there is a uh, another approach to signal extraction from in the presence of the numbers in the background. This uses maximum entropy, and uh, the approach here is that the idea is that with with uh, a limited set of information, uh, with, with incomplete knowledge of the signal, uh, you can extract uh, the, the the part that you don't know, uh, or rather any inferences uh, should should be based on a probability that maximizes the entropy of your of your uh, available data, and. Essentially, this is the this is a, a power correlation function, and this is the power spectrum. They're related to one another uh, through a Fourier transform. I'm not going to obviously not going to spend a lot of time explaining this because uh, I'm out of time. But um, this is a, an expression for the entropy of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, <coughs> signal, and you can use this and a couple pages of math that we skip here. And um, now we have a, a expression that maximizes the entropy of your uh, power spectrum. Uh, it has a couple of uh, 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 coefficients here that, that are related uh, by this matrix. We can solve this, and we can extract the Raman spectrum. So this is a this is a Raman spectrum, spontaneous Raman spectrum for ATP. This is the car spectrum, and using this approach that I just butchered, um, we can. You uh, recover full Raman spectrum. And this, this, this is very reliable uh, and very nicely. Uh, Mueller uh, and, and uh, Mueller and Alcor are the ones that, that, that first uh, demonstrated this with car spectrum. Um, the last last couple of slides. Uh, one more approach. And this and I won't go through the math here, but this uh, uses the fact that you can. Uh, that you can, uh, so, so let me just say, the, the maximum entropy approach requires a couple of thousand of Fourier transforms. For, you have to do a couple of thousand of Fourier transforms, you've got to solve this big uh, determinant, this big matrix equation, and so it takes a little bit of time. It involves no physics, uh, no physics specific to cars, right, to cars signal generation. So what we wanted to do is figure out a way to put the physics in and maybe get the signal out more quickly. Um, and so what we've done is can we write the equation for the car signal generation, uh, take the square root, and this is what we get. We can do a, a formative series expansion, and we get terms that are linear and chi and quadratic and chi and then higher order terms. Uh, the next thing that we'll do is we'll just truncate everything above the linear terms, and we get, with some approximation, something that looks like this. Our total car signal minus the numbers in the background is approximately equal to the real part of the, uh, the uh, susceptibility um, transform of the real part of susceptibility is a time dependent uh, uh, wrong response. Uh, it's got a negative time and a positive time component. We cut off a negative time, but with a positive time, we back transform that and we recover our spectrum. Uh, so that was very quick. Um, but the idea is that, that we can make this approximation, transform it, cut off the 
that they may get time in it and, and recover uh, what is an approximation of the normal spectrum. This is the this is our known spectrum, and then this is what we extract. So this is all simulation. Uh, and what you see is we get these the, the extracted spectrum from this approach looks similar to the known or the known spectrum, but it has these aberrations. And we know that those are due to the approximations we made, so we can take another series of approximations, do the same thing again, and lo and behold, we get this nice spectrum that's exactly like the one we started with. And two Fourier transforms. Uh, instead of a thousand, uh, we've just included the physics, um, and now we can show this on a real sample. This is a this is benzenitrile and ethanol, and this is the obviously we're going to get. Um, although it would be we get aberrations here with only the first approximation, we get this very nice peak here, and we also show the different uh, resonances that we obviously get. Or not, I'm not showing sure really Okay, so I have told you. About broadband cars, sort of the state that it's in right now. And, uh, I think it's got great potential uh, for, for non invasive chemical imaging. Um, we're starting to get to the point now that you can use data analysis approaches to get at the, at the vibrational spectra, uh, even in the presence of the non invasive background. And we're also um, uh, developing, I think, very nice approaches for, uh, for, experiment, for uh, experimentally reducing the non invasive background. Thank you. Thank you for your nice talk. So we have time for questions. So is there any questions? What are the competing technologies? Um so yeah, so so uh, infrared microscopy uh, has uh, is also non-invasive, but you get sort of 10 micron at best. Spatial resolution and water is a big problem with infrared because it's absorption. Uh, NMR is is also a uh, a um, another one that you can get some chemicals uh, and then spatial resolution. Again, the spatial resolution is not great on the order of 10 microns, and uh, and you must see water signal the way most of us do. Um, there are Imaging for, for microscopic imaging, there's also um, second harmonic and some frequency generation uh, that, that, that people do. And very nice in printings. Uh, in nice you mentioned that I think germanium dioxide is the ideal material to generate continuous broadband continuum. Um, when you have phase drift problems with the final laser, can you try to high stop fire laser? Uh, germanium dioxide. So the you can do that, yes. Um, the, the, the thing is that the, the cores, core sizes of the fibers we're using and their uh, nonlinear parameter are such that if we put enough power in, in uh, to, the, to the fiber to get a very broad continuum of the tie tie sapphire, it had to be 800 nanometers, and wavelengths were just short enough, we start burning the fibers. Okay. So. Uh, your, your time based approach and, and the various and various analyses that you're trying to do, it seems to me it might be appropriate for like some some of my composition. You can take your time based spectrum, pull out your, your non resonant background, put it much exactly, and then pull out your commercial spectrum separately to that kind of approach. And try. Yeah, we, we actually do. So I think that this requires a, a lot of. Um, it does. Time points, right? Yeah, it, it does require a lot of spectrum. Yeah, and, and we would like to, we're trying to go towards single shot, um, full spectrum, all in one shot. Uh, you can do it the other way, and, and, and people are working on that. Uh, we just, we want to we get everything in one shot, because we want to be very rapid. So, if uh, many of your, uh, in this technique, uh, you will essentially use only a small fraction of your laser power, like you go to the fraction across the field. Um, are there situations that you do not have enough laser power uh, and you need to do very long signal integration? Yeah, there could be. Um, we, so I'll tell you this the, the German, or the, uh, uh, the turbine fiber laser that we've got now is an 8 watt laser. Uh, and we went to 8 watts because we wanted to have lots of power. You can probably do this experiment with 2 or 3 watts. Um, but, uh, um, 
Yeah, that's. Uh, there will certainly be cases where you've got to, where you, without damaging the sample, you know, you have to stay at the work hour. Has been integrated for long. We, you know, we don't integrate for more than ten milliseconds. And so, well, I, I should say that more than fifty or sixty milliseconds. And so, uh, and that's just because you know we really want to drive this as fast as we can. I suppose if you had scientific, you know, reason to, to, to sit and try to get a good spectrum for that, that, we don't want to do that much. I'm interested in these continuum uh, source three color or simulation. Color yeah, those are actually those are experiment. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, and there were some that were shaped kind of like this, and others that were bigger. I'm wondering if there's any attempt to uh, interpret those graphs. I think something similar, um, like that. When one sees a narrow band curve up, or a Pringle-looking thing going the other way, what physical things? can be extracted from that. When one tries to interpret that, um, I know it's very interesting in itself, but well, ultimately we're dealing with trying to make it a useful tool. Right. So so this tells us directly about the time evolution of the light coming out of the end of the fiber. I mean that's because what we do is we take that light coming out of the end of the fiber, we mix it with a probe, with a pump and probe, and we generate cars. And so the, the frequency of the car's light that we get at any instant is, is uh, tells us about the frequency of the light coming out the other part. And, and a broader one over there, what, what would that tell you? Would uh, that, that tells you you got trouble. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it tells you that, that, that at any given time, you know, at this, at this time, you've got light coming out from 1250 to 1600, or uh, this is 1150. So, from 1250 to 1100 nanometers. And in fact, it's coming out at one millisecond, two, three, four, five, six. So you've got the lights just uh, somehow has not remained coherent coming through the fiber. We, we also have a running better feel as what the acronym CARS actually stands for. What is CA? Uh, coherent Anti Stokes Common Scatter. Yeah, I was wondering about what certain sort of downstream applications are being picked up first and what's the easiest thing to do and what's the holy grail? Okay. Uh, okay, so for me, the holy grail, if for broadband parts, the holy grail is to um, do things such as uh, I'm, we're working with a, a uh, guy that's, that's developing a, an endoscope now that's compatible with broadband parts. So if you had colonoscopy or, or some other kind of endoscopic procedure that they just be able to go in and, and spectroscopically image the epithelial cells in the lining of the lumen and, and just say, oh, you've got cancer there. Okay. Right now, it's not optically in the surgeon's got you know, this little microscope that he looks in and, and they do they fish around and they look for weird looking tissues. Uh, and you know, just it's pathologist who goes. Uh, but but we'd like to do quantitative, you know, tissue review. Um, another sort of holy grail for us is to be able to non-invasively walk, watch uh, stem cells differentiate, or look at a look at a tissue and see the so tissues are or uh, spatially structured. You know, skin is not skin. I mean, skin is. You, you have different cell types in different places. And in, in organs, you have different cell types in different places, which are specialized to be in that particular place. And, and we'd like to be able to, to just look at those and see what those different are. So those kinds of things, looking at spatial heterogeneity and cell types, is really important for tissue engineering. Right now, uh, with narrowband card, I mentioned that there are three microscopes on the market now. And, and some of these are being placed in uh, hospitals, you know, medical, uh, medical facilities and the physicians just want to get a quick look at a tissue because it's great. You get very high uh, contrast. You can see where the uh, where the, the membranes are. So you can see the um, Yes, I mean it's it's limited, uh, but but yeah, people yeah, are yeah. starting to have it. Okay, well, just last question. Just to expand on something, yeah, was uh, you know, the youth is 
I assume the technique is only for the surface sensitivity, so you're just seeing surface issues or more. Yeah, so, so with uh, with uh, warm wind lens with warm micron lens, you get actually reasonably good uh, uh, penetration of tissue. You can get a few microns, 10 microns or so in the tissue. And most cancer, uh, as it turns out, develops right at the, at the interface, right on the surface. Okay, so let's thank Marcus for his talk. Ten minutes well, so maybe we come back around quarter to ten. You know, and so there is coffee outside.